The theory of the consumer is very foundational to microeconomic analysis. One of the key aspects that we often analyze when looking at the theory of the consumer is indifference curve analysis. And in fact, the other approach to the theory of the consumer is often done through equations that are based on the indifference curves that we will analyze in this session. So this is very foundational to intermediate microeconomics, basic economic theory of the consumer. First what we'll do is we'll just get an idea of what an indifference curve actually is. An indifference curve is going to tell us uh, a relationship between two different goods or bundles of goods that a consumer could potentially consume. So what we often do is we do an example in economics where we compare uh, a consumer's preferences between guns and butter or two other goods. Often actually it comes down to an analysis of say housing or whatever consumption we want to look at and all other goods. So the bundle, the relevant bundle of goods becomes one thing that's important, say, our consumption of housing and everything else. So one way or another we're going to compare two different goods and we're going to see where we're indifferent between the two. So what are indifference curves? Indifference, cur indifference curves, like we said, is, is a graph showing different bundles of goods between which a consumer is indifferent. You don't care if you have five apples or if you have 14 oranges. Those two quantities of goods or bundles of goods really give you the same amount of pleasure or utility uh, as each other. So it's a graph showing these different bundles of goods where the consumer is indifferent between them. At each point on the cu curve, the consumer has no preference for one bundle over the other. Each point on the indifference curve gives the same level of utility to the consumer. So here we have an example indifference curve where we're comparing the consumption of shakes and pizza. All right, and we're going to highlight that on this indifference curve different points along the curve. You can see that points A, B, and C are all valued at the same utility. A U, U equals 100 is what's given in this example. Anywhere beyond this curve or further out from this curve is going to be valued at a higher measure than the utility of 100 utils or whatever we want to call it. So point D is going to be said to be more valued than points A, B, and C. A, B, and C were indifferent between all of those points. Point D is valued more. Point E then obviously would be valued less than A, B, or C. And given the curve there, it's also valued less than D. It's also very important to remember that we don't just have one indifference curve. It's not like some curve that has been plotted out from our measure of utility and that's the only curve. The utility curve is showing us how much utility we would get from different bundles of goods. Well, if the numbers of pizza or the numbers of shakes possible is very, very high, we have to take into consideration all the possible combinations uh, so we have to have a utility curve that exists when we only have one shake, and we have to have a utility curve that exists when we have 400 shakes. And so we have to realize that it's not one specific utility curve that actually exists, even though only one will end up being relevant within our analysis. But the fact is that there is really an infinite number of utility curves that exist, um, so, for example, in this one, we could look at a utility curve that gives us 75 utils, 100 utils, 125 utils, or 150 utils. And the reality is there's multiple utility curves in between each of these curves, even. Uh, it's just our subjective preference from the consumer being shown as one particular line. But the reality is there's an infinite number of utility curves that actually exist. It's also important to note that because of our analysis and the way we're, the logic of the situation that we have set forth, the model that we have set forth here, that our indifference curves can't cross. If you look at the logic of this situation, it's pretty obvious that this isn't true, that part of curve 1 could be below curve 2, and part of curve 1 could also be above curve 2. just doesn't make sense when we're talking about indifference. Keep in mind here, right? At point B here, we are said to be indifferent 
between that point and this point, point C. Well, if we're indifferent between those two points, how can it also be that we're indifferent between point A and point D? Why is this illogical? Well, because here we're saying B is not as preferred as A, and yet C is more preferred than point D. So how could these two points, B and C, be, per be indifferent between each other, and these two points, A and D, be indifferent between each other, and yet in one case, curve 2 is less preferred than curve 1, and in another case, curve 1 is less preferred to curve 2. When we look at how the consumer acts, we have to look at them as an optimizing rational creature. And what we're going to do is we're going to have their preferences given by these indifference curves. But then man doesn't just act based on his preferences, he acts within a situation of constraints. So to analyze man's, man's behavior as a consumer, we're going to look at his preferences and then also his constraints. Budget constraints are going to give us this straight line on the indifference curve map. It's going to show us all the possible distributions between those two goods. Basically, what can we afford? How many pizzas and how many shakes can we consume? What combinations of the two goods can we actually consume given the budget that we have? The budget line provides our constraint. That's the furthest out really we can go. And so what we'd like to be able to see is we'd love to push out this way as far as possible. That's what our preferences are telling us. Notice the utility levels go up as we move further and further out. But what the budget is doing is it's saying this is as far out as we can go. This is the max we can consume. This is our constraint. This is our limit limitation due to income or ability to consume. And so when we look at utility maximization, we're going to move as far out as we possibly can along these different indifference curves, but we're going to be constrained by this budget constraint. So what we're going to end up with is the slope of the indifference curve is going to be tangent to the budget constraint, so the slopes will be equal here at the point where we're maximizing utility. Why does this end up being the case? Why does it end up being the case that here at point A, we are maximizing our utility given this consumer's preferences and their constraints? Well, the utility curves are basically given to us here, the indifference curves. And if we look at it, if we were at some point, either B, D, or C, could we make ourselves better off? Certainly we could. Any move in from point B gives us, gets us to a higher utility curve. Remember that multiples exist. Any move in from C also does, or any move in or outward from point D closer to point A makes us better off. We'd be at a higher utility curve. And we keep doing that, and we can keep doing that and keep doing that until there's just one point where the indifference curve touches the budget constraint, such a case as where point A in this example touches the budget constraint, and there we're said to have maximized utility. We'd love to be out here at point E, but the reality is we cannot because we are constrained by our budget. And thus, if we're maximizing utility as an optimizing rational consumer, we're at that point where the two lines are tangent to each other. That's optimization where we have the indifference curve just touching the budget constraint. You can try that last example for yourself here on this graph. Here we're doing a utility maximization between hamburgers and french fries. You could see if we were on this original utility curve, you could draw other utility curves further and further out. Obviously we can't draw utility curves further out than any of them where point B is because we are constrained by our budget. So this is a graph that can give you another example to kind of play around with to be able to see it for yourself in a little bit more clear light. A term that's going to matter here when we're talking about the slope of the indifference curves is going to be the marginal rate of substitution. That's really the slope of the indifference curve at a given point. The marginal rate of substitution measures the willingness of a consumer to trade one good for the other. It's measured as the negative of the slope of the indifference curve at any point. At different points along the indifference curve, it's going to most likely be different marginal rates of substitution. Here we see an example of the marginal rate of substitution. If we give up one pound of rice a week each, how much do we get in return, or how much do we need to get in return to be indifferent 
according to these two different characters and difference curves. So if we look up, if we look at starting with four pounds of rice each week and then we give one pound up, if we look at the left curve, Texas indifference curve, if he moves back one unit of rice from four to three and he gives up one unit of rice, he's getting, he's indifferent between that and one more unit of potatoes. Right? But if we look at Mohan's indifference map, if he starts at four and then moves back to three pounds of rice per week or units of rice per week, right? how much potatoes does he need in return in order to basically be offset by this transaction of this drop of one unit of rice? In order for him to be indifferent between that situation, he has to gain two units of potatoes. On this next slide, we can see multiple marginal rates of substitution on one curve. So if we look at the top here, we can see a situation where we have three units of food being given up to offset one, a one unit gain in shelter. So in other words, our marginal rate of substitution here is basically three units of food for one unit of shelter, or three in this case. Whereas if we move down the curve, we can see we have different marginal rates of substitution on different points of this curve. So if we move down to this case where at the very bottom of the curve we're giving up just a quarter of a unit of food in order to gain one unit of shelter or to be offset. We need one whole unit of shelter just from a one quarter drop of food. So our marginal rate of substitution here of food to shelter is a quarter unit of food to one unit of shelter or a 0.25 marginal rate of substitution. If we look at the implications from this, we can see that down here at the bottom of the graph, food is relatively more important to the consumer. So it depends on how, what quantities we currently have, but this consumer being indifferent here, food is more important because we can see that giving up one unit of shelter, or to, in order to get one unit of shelter really, we'd ha only be willing to give up a quarter unit of food to get that one unit of shelter. Whereas if we're at different quantities, say up at the top, we'd be willing to give up three units of food just to get that one unit of shelter. In all those cases, really, we're still at the an indifferent level of utility. Any of those combinations make us equally happy. And if we look at the other side of the deal, the constraints that we face, we face basically this budget constraint, and this is a too-good world in this example, food and shelter. And so the only price mechanism that we have really is the cost of food in relative terms to shelter or the cost of shelter in relative terms of food. So price is really the cost of one good in terms of the other good. And here that's really going to be the slope as well. And so we can get a, an outcome of being at the optimal point when price is equal to the marginal rate of substitution. Price is going to be the slope of that budget constraint the marginal rate of substitution is going to be the slope of the indifference curve. All right, so now we're going to get to the actual application of indifference curves and budget constraints. We're going to look at our indifference curves in order to get some predictions about behavior. And in order to do this, we have to look at the changes in either opportunities or the changes in preference. So the first application of this we're going to do is we're going to imagine a parallel shift. We're going to look at a parallel shift of the budget constraint. What a parallel shift means is really it's an expansion or a contraction of the available opportunities without a change in the price ratio. The two goods have remained equally as costly, but for some reason or another, our budget constraint has either moved back in or further out. Easy examples of this are losing a job or getting a new job or winning the lottery, uh, having some kind of lump sum payment given to you. Now, when there's a parallel shift out, it doesn't just lead to, oh, one obvious answer. Here we can see the budget constraint in the first example. Uh, from point B, we have a certain budget constraint. We can see that we have this parallel shift out to this new line where we've hit with B prime on our indifference curve. The same thing has happened in the second graph where we've shifted out, and the third graph where we have shifted out to a new graph. In all of these, we're comparing the difference between the number of french fries and the number of hamburgers that a consumer gets. 
But we have three different things that can happen with the theory of the consumer in a parallel shift. In the first example, we see a parallel shift out, and the number of fries goes down and hamburgers goes up. Right? From point B to B prime, we see that we get fewer french fries, but we get much more hamburgers. In the second example, the number of hamburgers goes down. We move back this way to the left in the second example of the number of hamburgers, but we've also moved up towards B prime, which is an increase in the number of fries. And then in the third example, we see that both hamburgers has increased and the number of french fries has increased to the point where we move out to that B prime. So we could get three different potential things happening here. What this leads us to is an understanding of normal goods and inferior goods. With a parallel shift, you can easily identify these. Given a parallel shift, which means there's no substitution effect, which we'll get to later, if the consumption of a good moves in the same direction as the income change, in other words, if income goes up and your consumption of that good goes up, or if income goes down and the consumption of that good goes down, we call this a normal good. An inferior good is the opposite of that. Given a parallel shift, which means there's no substitution effect, the consumption of the good moves in the opposite direction as the change in income. So in other words, if income goes up, consumption of that good goes down. If that's the case, we have an inferior good. Most people would assume that once a good is normal, it is always a normal good, and once a good is inferior, it's always an inferior good. And that just does not true. So it's a common mistake that always happens. Once normal, always normal, or once inferior, always inferior, does not work. So for example, we start at the bottom budget constraint. We can see that as we increased income to this second budget constraint, this parallel shift out, the number of hamburgers that we actually consume actually drops. Right? So we actually went back a little bit in our consumption of hamburgers. Then we see another parallel shift out from the second budget constraint to the third budget constraint, and clearly the number of hamburgers has gone up. My favorite personal example of this situation actually comes with ramen noodles. As an undergrad and really an early grad student, I ate a fair amount of ramen noodles and I had a low budget constraint. I was very constrained by my budget. Once I snagged my first job, ramen noodles really were an inferior good for me. I moved out my budget constraint quite considerably, and the number of ramen noodles that I consumed dropped backwards to the point where I ended up at a point like on the second budget constraint as shown. I started eating things like mac and cheese, really spoiling myself, sometimes going out to McDonald's or, I don't know, uh, cooking up some basic meals that you would find in your local freezer section. Once I got a real job and started being paid a little bit better than that, my budget constraint got pushed out even further and I started having actual meals. I actually made meals for myself as opposed to just mac and cheese or things like that. The wealthy man's ramen noodles of Kraft mac and cheese was no longer my taste, but I actually made myself real meals. When I make real meals with this higher budget constraint here, I actually use crushed up ramen noodles again in some of my meals, such as things like salads. If you've never had it before, crushed up dry ramen noodles is actually a cool input for something like a steak salad. So my, my budget has gone up and my number of ramen noodles has also gone, gone up, which means now it is a normal good for me. So once again, once normal, always normal, does not work. So now we've done a parallel shift of the budget constraint. Now the second thing we're going to do is we're going to imagine a rotation of the budget constraint. A rotation of the budget constraint basically shows one good becoming relatively cheaper or more expensive than the other good. In doing the rotation, we're going to bring in not only the income effect that we showed with the parallel shift, but we're also going to show the substitution effect. We're going to highlight the difference here as we do the rotations to understand what, the in, what a substitution effect is and what an income effect is, which are very important terms in 
in difference curve analysis. So in order to do that, we're going to walk through an example. We're going to walk through this example quite extensively. We're going to have this budget constraint between apples and oranges. You can see we originally were at a, at a situation where we had a certain budget constraint, and now our budget constraint has rotated. It stayed the same with the amount of apples that we could consume, but now the number of oranges that we can consume has shot up drastically. So in this case, the price of oranges has dropped seriously. So it used to be that we had, say, $15. The price of an apple was $1, and therefore we could consume 15 apples. And the price of an orange was $3, and the max that we could consume, therefore, with our $15 would be so given that information, we could draw this original budget constraint in. But now what we're saying is that the price has dropped from $3 for an orange to $1. Well, if the price of an orange is $1 and we have $15, that means that we could now get 15 oranges. Well, how many more apples can we get? Well, the price of an apple has remained the same. It's still $1 and we still only have $15. And so therefore, we can still only get 15 apples. So our budget constraint has rotated because the price of one good has changed relative to the price of the other good. So with that rotation, what we're going to be able to tell is really the substitution effect and the income effect. And then the substitution effect or the income and the income effect is going to be able to tell us if it's a normal or an inferior good. It's very important to identify the substitution effect first. The income effect will tell us if, it's, if the good is normal or inferior, but first what we have to do is we'll have to identify the substitution effect. Okay, so what are these two things? The substitution effect is the change in the amount consumed that is a result of the relative price change of the good. It is due to the relative price ratio. It is not due to, oh, uh, apples have become cheaper and so now we're a little bit wealthier. Instead, it's due to the fact that apples are cheaper relative to oranges or vice versa. The income effect is the other side of that. The income effect is the change in the amount consumed that is a result of us just having more income. If oranges get cheaper somehow, we can afford more oranges. And so there's going to be some impact of us getting more oranges just because now we can afford more. That's going to be the income effect. The substitution effect is because oranges are now cheaper relative to apples, and so we get more oranges because the relative cost has changed, or opportunity cost has changed. But then the income effect comes about because we have more income to use to get that good. When looking at normal versus inferior goods, when we are doing a rotation analysis, not a parallel shift, you have to be much more careful because your income could actually increase and you could consume more of that good or a good, and yet it could still be inferior. Right? What we're really looking at is the change from the income effect to tell us whether it is a normal or an inferior good. I think this helps to demonstrate graphically. Okay, so let's go back to the example that we had. Remember we had this rotation. We originally had this budget constraint where we could consume five oranges and 15 apples. And then what happened is oranges became cheaper, so we're now wealthier essentially. We can now consume more oranges, not just five, but 15. So we've moved our budget constraint out. We've become wealthier. Well, what we want to do is we want to stick to this original point, point A, where we were optimizing before this cheaper orange uh, occurrence happened. Right? And we want to stick to this point, point A, and we want to say, okay, what if the relative price of oranges and apples changed, but we weren't wealthier? We weren't able to consume more right, more oranges. We didn't have this wealth effect. We just had this relative price ratio change. That's going to tell us the substitution effect. Remember, the substitution effect is the change 
that is a result of the relative price changes, but not from the change in wealth. So what we want to do is we want to stay at this sta same level of wealth, essentially, but then twist or change the ratio of the oranges to apples. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the new ratio that we have of oranges to apples. We're going to say, what? This is our ratio here. What is it? It's basically a one-to-one -one ratio in this nice example. What we're going to do is we're going to say, what if that ratio existed but at the old level of wealth? So what we do is we take this line, the, the, the slope of the new budget constraint, and we move it back until it's just tangent with the old indifference curve. That's drawn in here with this dotted line. It's basically the new budget constraint parallelly shifted back until it just is touching the old indifference curve. What that's giving us is the old level of wealth, essentially, but the new price ratio. And we get this new point, point B here. So what we get is this move from a quantity of 3 to a quantity of 5 when we move from point A to point B. That's our substitution effect, the move from 3 to 5. The substitution effect is this increase in the number of oranges that would be purchased given the new relative prices or the new price ratio while still staying on that same indifference curve. That's our substitution effect. A parallel shift of the new budget constraint back onto the old indifference curve and then seeing where that resulting point is or the new optimal point would be and then showing the difference between the quantity of oranges and in this case it's a move from 3 to 5 that's our substitution effect. Obviously what remains then is going to be the income effect. So in this case it's the move from point 5 to point 7. This is the income effect. The income effect is what basically remains after the substitution effect. It's the additional consumption of oranges due to the increased purchasing power. Now, the substitution and income effect don't always move in the same direction. So basically show the same budget constraint here, but instead change the example from apples and oranges to apples and second-hand clothing. The budget constraint example really remains exactly the same, 15 and 5 to 15 and 15. But what we've done really is we've changed the shape of the indifference curve or the slope of the indifference curves to show you what can happen in having the substitution effect and the income effect move in different directions. So again, what we did is we took the new, or the new budget constraint, we parallelly shifted it back to the old indifference curve. Here's the old indifference curve and saw where it hit. So here's the parallel shift back, the dotted line. It hits at point B. The move from quantity at point A, which is 3, out to a quantity of 5 at point B. That's the substitution effect. So from 3 to 5, we get this substitution effect. But then we see that now that we're here at point B, moving the rest of the way out to point C is actually in the opposite direction. We actually move back uh, to a quantity of 4 of secondhand clothing at point C. Right? So we have completed the substitution effect here, but the income effect is an actual move from 5 to 4. What does this show us? This shows us that secondhand clothing is an inferior good. If the income effect moves in the opposite direction of the substitution effect, you have an inferior good. If they move in the same direction, you have a normal good. So here again is another diagram for you to analyze, getting a different picture of it, and look at and see the substitution effect, the income effect, and then the overall total effect. And you can say, is this a normal good or is this an inferior good? Right? And this should be pretty straightforward. The substitution effect moves in the same direction as the income effect, and thus you have a normal good. In this example here, we have the substitution effect moving in the opposite direction of the, as the income effect, and so you have an inferior good. In both of these cases, note that the good under consideration here as being normal or inferior is the good that's along the horizontal axis. The good that's along the vertical axis has a different substitution and income effect that can be uh, 
analyzed differently. But here what we're doing is we're talking about the good on the horizontal axis. So in the original example, the good that was the second-hand clothes was the inferior good. It doesn't stand also true for the good that's along the vertical axis. Giffen goods are an extreme example of an inferior good. A Giffen good really isn't all that relevant to economic analysis because they're so incredibly rare to the point where you could actually argue that they're non-existent. Some people, some students really like to look to work on the quirky examples that could potentially be Giffen goods, but this doesn't really matter that much to real world important economic analysis. What a Giffen good is, is essentially a situation where an income effect works in the opposite direction of the substitution effect, so much so that it actually dominates the substitution effect. If that's the case, you have a Giffen good. In other words, if we look back at the last graph, uh, where we had an income effect and a substitution effect. The income effect worked backwards against the substitution effect, but the income effect wasn't larger than the substitution effect. If on the last graph point C was to the left somehow of point A, then we would have a Giffen good. It, that's a situation where the income effect is actually larger than the substitution effect. Again, these aren't really practical for actual economic analysis, and so we're not going to spend too much time on them. However, you should have an understanding as to what a Giffen good is and a basic introduction to it. That basically wraps up our introduction to indifference curves. You should have a basic understanding of what happens when there's a shift, or a parallel shift or a rotation of budget constraints, what a budget constraint is, what an indifference curve is, uh, what the substitution effect is, what an income effect is, what a normal good, an uh, inferior good, and a Giffen good uh, all are when compared to each other based on indifference curve analysis. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email or try and stop by and see me.